Thank you for the invitation. I guess that Julie is the one to blame for trying to talk about the brain after you know, very precise and specific discussion on things that you can define precisely. Nobody argue about what you're doing. So I'll try to do my best. Uh, usually, this is a longer talk or a longer tutorial in which we try to explain uh, why complexity is associated with criticality. I'll define everything. And all that just means that we have applied these ideas to the brain, to proteins, to mitochondria inside the cells, to patterns in lipid bilayers and so on, both experimentally and theoretically. Um, the, the motto is that indeed the laws of physics are very simple, but nature is complex. So usually when biologists are confronted with this, they neglect any role for physics in trying to understand biological complexity. When you write down the few fundamental equations in physics and realize that there's only three or four letters, and there is only three or four equations, they say, how the hell this biological complexity will arise from? Hmm? They need different laws and different ad hoc explanations and so on. I will not do that. I'm a very lousy uh, person. So I try to simplify my life, and I trust that physics will give me simple laws for complex systems. Okay, that's sort of the motto. The take home message for the brain for today, for the young people trying to understand how they can use these new devices into building a brain-like structure is the brains are not circuits. Okay, if you remember that, that's the take home message. Are not circuits, forget about circuits. So if you're thinking into building the circuits of the brain, uh, that's for 1950. Today, we understand that brains are not circuits, and so the question is, if they are not circuits, how the hell they work? I'll try to convey the message. These are the, the papers. I will go not through all of this. Uh, actually, when we started, there was no data, so we have to sort of do a lot of waving ham arguments. Everything what I said today is supported by very precise experiments, which you, if you have time, you can argue with me later. This is an important disclaimer because this is a collective process. So I'm trying to talk about something. I look at your faces. If you look like, oh, no, I change my message. So <laughs> if you start asking detailed questions, my objective of drawing a horse will end up like this. Okay? And if the chairperson is not very, very happy and stand up very soon, you know, that's how it's going to, to, to do. This is also adapted from how a typical 20-minute talk goes. That's for the young people. If you're invited to a 20-minute talk, say no. Okay? And then say no, and then put a poster. <laughs> right, you have one hour to discuss. In 20 minutes, you can start. This is the, the outline of the longer talk. This is the question that we try to answer for the last 20 years in different uh, domains. Why life is more often found near criticality? You will understand this concept very precisely in a minute. This is a 10-minute pedestrian manifesto for the non conoscenti on the fact that nature is not too rigid, neither very flexible. It's not too ordered, it's not too disordered. Look outside. You have beautiful examples of this intermediate state. So, but you will say, but I take courses on oscillatory process, on ordered process, on a ground state, and this and this, and I take a courses on gases and blah, blah, right? Because these two extremes are very simple 20 years ago to study. But the stuff in the middle is what we are trying to uh, understand now. So we apply these ideas to a number of things, and today we are going to talk about brains. An historical, a couple of historical remarks just to situate the young people that forget very quickly where they're coming from. And then in the 80s, the intuition was already there that these processes, life, brain, languages, protein, turbulent glasses, was found, this, this high complexity process were found between the disordered and the ordered phase. Okay? And this cartoon 
was done by Hans Frauenfelder, today is 96 years old, and goes to Los Alamos to his office. And I just discovered, preparing for this talk, that there is a last year paper on the APS on the role of physics in biology, beautiful paper. So Hans draw this cartoon. So he has the intuition that between order and disorder, between crystal and gas, we will have this increased complexity. And this is not complex, this is not complex. High entropy, low entropy, are based, very easy stuff. But there was no experiment, there was no theory, but Hans, indeed, he was studying for many, many years proteins, uh, have this intuition. In the, in the 90s, this person is pair back, he died very early uh, in 2004, 18th of October, the day is today, 18th of October, 2003. This is me, believe it or not. This is King Christians and now in Imperial, and this is Joseph Olami, uh, die also in uh, very early. So I guess that I'm next. Uh, Kim told me that. So this picture was taken in the Brookhaven National Lab. Per Mack <coughs> was the one that took the job to build a very toy model, later was called Sampire model or self analytically model, and to, uh, to sort of formalize how a system, instead to go to the ground state that is order or disorder, it will stay in the middle forever. Somehow you have to feed back some notion of order parameter with some notion of control parameter. It's like heating a magnet, a ferromagnet, with some temperature that is proportional to how much magnetization has the, the stuff, okay? And he discovered the system with this feedback will go eventually to this critical state and stay in this critical state, which have particular properties, which will be the reason of this, of this talk, okay? So I will elaborate on what is peculiar about being critical. Now, nowadays, we have many experiments showing that all these systems, when they are critical, they are complex, what we call high complexity. So it seems that criticality is the way to build complex systems, one of the ways to build some, something complex. So these are some, some comments, and this is a book in Spanish that we wrote with a friend in, in Spain. This is sort of the historical context. Nothing is really new. <laughs> in 1941, McCulloch, the same one that McCulloch and Pitts, individual formalization of neurons, were doing experiment putting estrignin, which is a poison, into the head of, into the brain of monkey. And he was describing these avalanches of estrignin. And he was amazed because these avalanches, activity propagating the entire brain of the, of the monkey, was not supposed to be because he put estrignin in something that was supposed to be auditory cortex, and the avalanche propagated to the visual cortex, and so on. I said, but what the hell is going on? How is this long range correlation discovered by this methodology in 1941 was happening. If the, the brain is supposed to be confined, this stuff is for auditory perception, this stuff is for visual. And he discovered in, this, in these maps in 1941, this <coughs> process of long range correlations that now we attribute to criticality. Turing, in one of his writings, he said that an idea presented to such a mind, he's talking about what, what, how the mind works in terms of, he was talking about nuclear reactions, chain reactions, and says, if I have an idea, my brain starts generating many, many ideas, my brain will explode. Mm -hmm. But he concluded that an idea presented to such a mind will on average give rise to less than one idea in reply. <laughs> in, in my neighborhood in Argentina, this is essentially very true. <laughs> per back in 94, it's, he actually was very, very enthusiastic and everything was critical. I'm sure that some of you have met Per, the older guys, and will agree with me. He was one of my best friends for many, many years. And so if the world is critical, the brain has to be critical. There is a discussion that I can go on that this is self-consistent. Then in 97, we wrote this little paper, Learning with Extremal Dynamic is Critical. And this is a paper in which we try to realize a system that just by itself learn to do something only if the system is critical, okay? If you're interested about how to implement this model into the realm of uh, memory stores at one city, 
at 1.30 will be here, a little gathering of all the people that are interested, and we can discuss, because at that time, this was a before men restores existed, but this is, there is an easy implementation for that. In 2003, Dietmar Plens rediscovered the McCulloch avalanches together with John Bex in NIH. I was part of that discovery, but Pearback once recommended me that somebody offered you an authorship, say no. Because the probability that that paper will be cited at least once is very low. So your impact ratio will go surely down because that paper will be cited. But if you ask them <laughs> not to put in the authorship, but to cite you, immediately your impact factor goes to up. So if you go to the reference section, the acknowledgement of those papers will descend to me. I have to make some joke early in the morning, otherwise I will. <laughs> okay, don't worry, I won't talk about all of this. This is the evolution of Chialvo's criticality in the brain. I just wanted to say that the, the most recent studies that we are doing are how the criticality in the brain is affected by anesthesia, by psychedelic drugs. And indeed, all this, all this experiment tends to indicate that indeed the normal resting spontaneous fluctuation that you see in the brain at any scale, large scale, small scale, is consistent with critical dynamic, meaning that the brain indeed, no matter what you do, the, the spontaneous state is critical according to all these publications. Now, of course, I cannot go and try to convince you that you, think you, you don't give a damn about neurons and brain, all these experiments, the technical details, but I have to illustrate somehow uh, how, what is our, our, our reasoning. So I will challenge you, instead to list all the, all the evidence, to choose a system that you know, that you're familiar with, okay, which exhibit all these properties at once. Okay? You're thinking a dynamical system, a real system, whatever, that have a very large number of degrees of freedom. Hmm? These degrees of freedom could be skirmions, could be atoms, could be whatever, neurons, could be individuals, could be spins, with mostly short-range interaction. Let's choose nearest neighbors. This is important. Short-range interaction, very large number of particles. They have the longest correlated state. Everyone feels everyone else. Meaning I spin one here, and no matter how large is the system, it will be affected far away. Choose the, they have the highest susceptibility. It's very sensitive to even extremely minute perturbation. So I only flip one spin, and I have a change in the order parameter. Now I, I switch 99% of the spin, and the system still is able to encode this 99% change, meaning that dynamic range is huge, starting from very susceptible to the entire saturation. Very large dynamic range, very sensitive, and no saturation with similar perturbations. Have the largest distributed memory storage, no limits. Meaning that if, if encoding means flip one element, one degree of freedom of your system, okay, now you can encode the largest number of, of memories in that system. Also, the longest memory in time, also no limits. So what I do now with this system, okay, will what happens in the future will be contingent to what I did now for the, for the entire history of the system, since you build it to now. Uh, and of course, these two, six and seven, uh, uh, the no limits means that you make a bigger system and your memory increase proportionally to that. Show contingency, I already mentioned it, dependence on unique long gone past event. Largest number of internal state, also known as configuration. Hmm? The largest, largest related to the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, insensitive up to a degree to this detailed structure. And it doesn't matter if I choose a lattice, if I choose a, a different, different interaction, but always short range. So, and even you can keep listing. Okay, so this now, the answer to that question is any system able to go near a second order phase transition, 
So any relatively large distributed nonlinear system with short range interaction. Okay? The answer to that question, which system you can choose, is any of these systems, any system that goes to the second order, you have all this property for free. You don't have to wire any circuit, you don't have to think in neuron, you don't have to think in anything. You take a system, you go to the critical state, if the critical state is in the middle of a second order phase transition, all these properties appear that I mentioned. So I, I hope that I've been able to uh, bias you to think that the answer to that question was the brain. Okay. But no, it could be the immune system, it could be a large flock of interacting birds flying around. Okay. Uh, it could be the atmosphere at a large scale. Uh, it could be traffic, many cars interacting when they are near the jamming transition. They have all these properties. Think about this idiot that break and produce a collapse of the entire highway. Now you, you start thinking into these ideas and you will see that this system have all these properties at once. Of course, the classical uh, ferromagnetic near Curie temperature is a typical case. Probably except saturation. Yes. You said there is no saturation mm -hmm. for any of this system. You have very clear saturation. That's called final size effect. Increase the size of the of the system, and your saturation goes to the size of the system. Mm -hmm. That's the scaling. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Uh, so, what means critical? Okay, I'll do you give you three examples. And I'm sorry if I offend your intelligence because this is, of course, very pedestrian for the non conoscenti But I will take a simple example in which you will see some of the features of the critical state, which are that you have to understand if you're going to use this concept to build some brain-like machine with your devices. Think that you have a bag and it's full of buttons, okay? And you start your experiment, and this is the disconnected phase. Why? Because I asked Julie to put her hand in the back, remove, and every time that she put the hand, remove one button. Okay? So now I ask her to uh, plot the number, the number of buttons, and when the experiment starts, you have only one button. And every time that she put the hand before, she will go and make a link between two arbitrary buttons. Okay? So. You will be the testing and you will be the encoding. And so after you do that, of course, the number of bottoms that every time that actually pick from the back randomly, it will eventually increase. And eventually, after many, many links, the 100% every time that she put her hands, remove all the bottoms. Okay? This is a transition okay, between a disconnected phase and a connected phase. So you can think into proteins that are interacting, neurons that are interacting, percolation, fire through a forest, whatever. This diagram is universal. Not every sigmoidal function is a, the signature of a critical transition, of course. In this example, in this pedestrian example, the reason why I'm choosing this is because I will ask you to identify what is the critical point of this transition. And there is a... A, a lesson to learn from this trivial experiment, if you compute instead to the number of bottom, you repeat this experiment many times, and you compute the standard deviation of the number of bottoms. And you will see that the standard variance, when the density of link is low, or when the density of link is high, meaning every time that you repeat the experiment with the same number of links, you will see that the variance is zero. Because it's every time that you put your hand, you remove a button. Every time you put your hand, you remove all the buttons. There is no variability. But when you're near the transition, the variability peaks. And indeed, this trivial example can show that if you compute the variability, the peak variability goes like with an exponent, with the first power law that I mentioned today, okay? And the largest variability, mean the largest cluster, also goes to with a power law. And again, this is the saturation effect I mentioned my colleague here. This N tells you what is the saturation for that. But that doesn't mean that there's a real saturation. It's a finite size effect. You put more buttons, and this N goes 
to a larger bottom. And if you take the thermodynamic limit and infinite, the variability is infinite. So what is the lesson? That maybe some experiments in biology are not lousy experiments or very valuable experiments. Are experiments that are exhibiting the intrinsic variability of being near a critical point. So this is the fair example in which you can identify this peculiar property, largest variability of the transition, which is very, very useful for experimentalists when you're trying to identify what the hell is going on, is as a function of the order parameter, you have the largest peak in the largest variability, and as a function of the size of your system, the variability increase like a power law, bingo, you know a little bit more about your experiment. Second example, traffic. Again, you have a disconnected phase for low density. I'm, I'm, I'm plotting here. I'm showing here a hypothetical example of a structure in which you have individual degrees of freedom, which are the drivers. You have some nonlinear dynamics. They break or speed up based on some threshold, nobody in front of you or somebody in front of you. And if you keep increasing the density of cars, you will go from the gas phase to the solid phase, which is the jamming, nobody's moving. Okay? And in the middle, I make a, a composite of half of this picture and half of this picture. You have a mix of order and disorder. You have places in the system, you have everybody speeding up, and places in the system, you have the solid phase. So the critical state for this system is a mix of order and disorder. Now, in this simple system of transportation, actually the first model was due to Kay Nagel in his uh, PhD thesis here in Germany. Uh, he considered a very simple model that now tells, tells us almost everything to understand what is the dynamic of traffic. So you have, you increase the density of cars in this simple example, and you measure the flow of cars through a point. So you have a spatial density that measure in one mile, how many cars per mile, but then you put in a, in a section of the highway and you count how many cars, okay? You plot it and you see that as you increase the number of cars, you, the density of cars, the throughput, increase linearly, okay? But now you have, you reach a point, a critical point, in which the, the throughput is not, keep, not, is not keeping increasing. So you have the first traffic jam, the, the flow at that point okay, cannot be larger than this point, okay? And not only that, but the throughput start decaying after the critical point. And so at this point, you have a phase of free flow and a phase of jamming, solid phase. And at this point, for the traffic engineer, this is the, the best point because he reached he achieved the largest performance for the highway. So good, I'm using every single dollar to achieve that point. But for you, this is the worst point because it assures you, okay, that you can stay there for as long as you, as you live in the thermodynamic limits. Now, the number of vehicles passing through a point as a function of density of vehicle, this fundamental diagram, is nothing to do with cars. You can see it in many other systems. You can do this for blood cells in your, in, your, in, your, in your arteries. You know why you have 45% of blood cells in your artery? This is if you have more, you have jumps. If you have less, you don't have enough oxygen. So, and again, this is a universal principle that has nothing to do with the detailed structure of the system. But the dynamics is exactly the same, even quantitatively speaking, because the exponent that you get from blood cells or from cars are exactly the same. Again, system with low, short interaction, develop long range correlation and all this phenomenology. Now, I said before that at this critical point, you have to have the largest variability. What will be here in traffic? Well, make the trip 10 consecutive days from your office to, to your house, add the critical density of cars, and measure how much time it takes to get from home to your office. And if the density is low, the variability in the time travel will be low. There's nobody there in, the, in the street, so you go fast, you get there. And the next day, you go fast, you get there, and the next day, and so on. But at the critical density, the variability is the largest one. 
So that means that the criticality, the variability is maximum, and you can have, now talking about space, not time, the equivalent. Because what you see in space and what you see in time are two sides of the same coin. So if you go and look at the size of the jams, not the variability in the time travel, but the size of the jam, you have a distribution that is a power law, which tells you that you can be in a jam of the size of the system. <laughs> Meaning that you can have jams as long as the system is, which is some of the properties that I mentioned before. Okay? So these are the conceptual things that are relatively easy to, to understand, intuitively speaking, as long as you remove your ordered or disordered picture from your head. Yes, my horse, my picture is start going. Yes. I'm a little confused about one thing. Um, I think this maybe is also the analog of aging, but where's the memory? So like the, if you're in this kind of phase. So How you measure to... memory in, 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 in your stuff? How you measure memory? In where is the memory? <laughs> if you measure the correlation function in time and space, okay, that is where the memory. So the autocorrelation, how an event today is related with an event three years ago, if the correlation function decay exponentially, there is no memory. Okay? If the correlation function decay in time, it's like a power law, it means that you have contingency from the day in which you were born. And in space, the same. So if I want to affect a, a spin in a given place, for instance, the memory will be, uh, let me give you a, a specific example of traffic. When the size, the time to produce a jam in the jamming phase, it is very fast. You just make an idiot to break before and you pile up. You immediately, you pile up hundreds of cars. The time to remove the jam, not because we are humans, just because you have to speed up each car to the, to the speed and make the whole, this, it take, it take a lot of time to remove that. So the memory in that case is that the perturbation is dissipated, not exponentially fast. It's dissipated with a power law in time, okay? Yes, there my picture is going to go away. <laughs> On the same point, in some sense, the perfect memory would be if the cars were all there in the same place 10 years later, right? So the what, the perfect memory? If the cars were all in the same place 10 years time, you would have a perfect memory. If the perfect memory, uh, the perfect memory is proportional to n. So if the, si if the highway and the number of cars is infinitely large, the perfect memory is there. So it's infinite time. We'll, the jump will remain there for infinite time. Okay? But it's always in the, in the, in the limits, in thermodynamic limits, but we are dealing with finite. So it's just proportional to n, which is handy experimentally because you can test these things. Okay? So I still not even talk about the, the brain, so you know, forgive me if I have to skip some questions just to keep the memory of what I said two minutes ago. That's another example. This is my favorite one, because here you have three phases at the same time. I told you that criticality is a mix of order and disorder. Okay? This is the perfect example. The weather, all time, is a mix of the three. And I have a sort of a equivalent to that for the brain. I will show it to you later. But before, for the young people, I ask my students, when you think that the notion that water in what we call this phase, this phase, or this phase, was a different matter, like a water, a solid water, a solid water, a leg, was a completely different matter. When that was realized by us humans, all the students put about, you know, the time of Jesus or, you know, the medieval Eva, so hundreds and hundreds of years ago. When I tell them, these are undergrad students, that it's not, it's 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Before 120 years ago, we believed that this and this were different pieces of matter, like gold and silver or, or, or iron. That's the reason why alchemy tried to go from iron to earth, because they believed indeed that you can boil water and get something different, completely different. You know, you can inundate this room with one cubic millimeter of, of water. 
So they believe that what, in order to change matter, you have to change uh, interaction. And this is the same interaction that here, here. You can just increase temperature or pressure. So the notion that the same stuff can be manifested at the different correlations is relatively new. So my take on this is for you is that probably the brain doesn't need to change circuits in the same way that water had not to change interactions. The same structure with a single global parameter can be manifested as Kialbo talking or Kialbo sleeping or Kialbo laughing or Kialbo listening or whatever. So this is how we interpret the brain, at least the people that I like, which is about three in the entire planet, which is <laughs> you don't have to change the circuit because the proof is that in physics you can have very different things just by changing a single parameter. Okay, so summing up, I guess that the variability of the parameter, all of these that we were discussing, are the sort of the most important things that you get generically in any system that is large enough and is close to a critical point. I'm not talking about how you get to this critical point or if this critical point is a equilibrium, meaning you change, you have a exquisite control parameter, you put it there, or if its system goes spontaneously in the spirit of self-organized criticality to that, we don't know that. What we're going to do next is try to see if, and I will go fast, because I'm sure that you're not interested in all the bloody details of the brain, but what was the strategy for the last 10 years that we used it to show experimentally that indeed the brain is critical under this uh, prem premise, see, okay? Any question up to here? No? Beautiful, my horse will go very fast. So the point is, just to motivate you, if criticality is a solution, what is the problem, okay? You should laugh to this, to this joke. Uh, any question about this joke? The, the problem is that the brain cannot work like electric, electrical circuits, okay? Otherwise you will need a control unit, another brain, to modify the connection of this brain. A circuit is something rigid, okay? And I guess that if you follow this, this uh, argument, this is a problem to solve. The other thing that usually is, is not, uh, is not uh, well elaborated, to say it, is that synaptic interaction means connection between neurons, are very weak. This is very important. It's almost silly, but it's important for a physicist to know if you're talking about weak interaction or strong interactions, okay? Because this is a fact. Also, they are short range. Sorry for that. <laughs> what is the time scale of interest? Excuse me? The time scale of interest, what is that? For instance, that... behavior. I, don't, I didn't get to that. So with behavioral time scales. I didn't get it. You will get it in a minute. Okay. Very weak is a fact. It's a, independently if you pay attention or not, but it's a fact. One, one neuron, uh, yesterday somebody says 50 neurons in one of the talk. It's not true. You need 1,000, sometimes 10,000 incoming inputs in order for me to fire. So it's a huge difference between 50 and 10,000. Because that means that nobody, no neuron will decide anything. There should be some consensus. And you cannot average out because you will see that this thing, these quantities don't average out, okay? The behavior of 10 stupid guys in the highway are not the same to the average. Because it, like, only one of them break, you have the, the, you have the, the avalanche of curves. Uh, short range, meaning don't make any fancy connection between neuron 73 in the frontal cortex with that one and fix my time of interest when I'm talking to you, I'm doing something in a so-called circuit of language, blah, 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 without changing any connection. Because the synaptic change is something that works in the very low time scale, very slow time scale, minutes. So I will not be able to do anything, okay, in this time scale, in the time of scale of behavior which is what you, the brain is supposed to do. Save your ass, find a mate, and find food. This is how the brain is built, and this is the function, okay? Not to compute the square root of two. 
Uh, and again, this is for just a message to imply that synchronization usually is not in the weak interaction regime. Synchronization is something that happens at the strong coupling, okay? Even in generic oscillators and so on. So this is sort of a, to, to, to summarize that this is the problem you have to solve. You have to build something that will have all these properties that we mentioned at the beginning in this kind of regime without changing any, any of that. That's the motivation to go and say, okay, maybe the solution to this problem is the involvement of universal generic mechanism of emerging complex phenomena that is evident in dynamical systems which are near the critical point of second order phase transition. At that time, 2010, when I wrote this, this, this uh, review article for Nature, uh, we have some experimental evidence, but not as much as we have now, eight years after that. Uh, so we started to look in the brain at large scale for, indeed, correlation function. So if you want to know about your system is near, far, critically, you measure the correlation function in time and space, and then you see how they relate to each other, okay? Remember that I said at the beginning that the temporal correlations and the spatial correlations are all linked because the, the dynamic of the system doesn't distinguish, doesn't even know what space and time is. Because the only thing that it does is to look at the car in front of you, break, if it's closed, or accelerate if it's not there. And everything else emerges, okay, at the critical point as a given. So the thing is that we started looking at the correlation function in space. This is an experiment from 2005. And uh, you can see that most of the correlation pairs are very weak, well, almost zero. A few years later, yes? No? A few years later with uh, with colleague in, in London, we look at specifically what is the decay of the correlation function in the brain using magnetic resonance imaging. I'm talking about huge uh, spatial scale for the entire brain. And we were able to extract a few exponents that tells you from the very short distance in millimeters, let's say two millimeters, to the entire size of the brain the correlation, the two-point correlation function decayed like a power law. Precisely as you expect, one of the, if you don't have this, you can continue talking about criticality. This was 2000 and, and something. Now, following with correlation function, what truly matters is not this correlation function that I showed you before, which is like, like the Pearson correlation function averages over all two points in the brain, but what truly matters is what is called also connected correlation function uh, in order to determine what is the correlation length. The correlation length tells you in a system that is uh, big enough how much you have to walk until find somebody that is doing something that is completely uncorrelated with you, so I mean correlation zero. So what you do is, important thing is to subtract the mean activity of everybody, imagine that you are the spins of neurons or whatever, and you subtract the mean at time t, so along the, the, the columns, and you, now you measure the correlation function between the resulting pairs, okay, and you accumulate it as a function of the distance, okay? What you are after is something like a family of curve, okay, for different size of the system. And you will see that when the system is relatively small, the zero crossing of, of the correlation function is about five millimeters. When the, when the size of the system that you measure is much larger, the correlation, the zero crossing is larger. That zero crossing is that point that I'm looking for, the point in which that guy is doing whatever he, he cares to do independently of me. So this is the zero crossing. No part of the, of the system is uncorrelated. Only that point. Because these are positively correlated, these are negatively correlated. That means that nobody is doing anything independently, except that you have to plot each of these points as a function of the size of the system to figure it out that the correlation length increase with the size of the system. Yes? Sorry, I'm confused. How is this connected correlation function different from the two point correlation function you were talking about? And two important things. When you just do Pearson correlation, 
in a system that, for instance, let's suppose that we measure the first correlation function, the one that we showed before, and somebody's pushing us from below, okay? You measure the two correlation function, and you will have that everybody's correlated with everybody. Some people call it spurious correlation. Somebody's moving us from below, so we are correlated by a common mode, okay? Yes? Uh -huh. So that is the two-point correlation function, the traditional one. The connected correlation function is you subtract at each time step, okay, the mean of the time series of everybody. In that way, you are subtracting this common mode. Then when you calculate the correlation function this way, you will see that your correlation function obviously crosses zero, right? Some part is anti-correlated, some part is correlated, but that's not the point. The point is that when now you increase the size of the system, this point moves to the right. So that means that the correlation length increases with the size of the system, and that only happens in criticality. Also in quantum, but that's another matter, okay? So why? Because the critical, the critical dynamics assure you that indeed there is no notion of a scale. The scale is the size of the system. The system is scale-free. Nobody knows how large is that system. If you're in a traffic jam, you cannot know how long or how large is the traffic jam. Because your information is local, your perturbation is local, you have no idea. This is one of the properties of the critical state. So once that you get this, this, this increase in the correlation length with the size, you say, voila, this system that have scale-free correlation, the first correlation for this, if it's not critical, you have to, them to, to have a null hypothesis for that. This is unique. If you get this, uh, you're in business. Now you can say, OK, oh, let me calculate mutual information. If you're in the biology business, information is, is something more meaningful. It's exactly the same. But if you calculate the same curve before, but instead to calculate the two-point correlation, you calculate the mutual information, you see that the mutual information increased with the system size. That, what, is the, what is the meaning of that? Well, that indeed the exchange of information between places in the system, if you think about neurons or persons or whatever, is independent of how far they are or how big is that system. It's the most efficient situation. And the point is that in this case, you can take this curve that look very different to each other, and if you now rescale this axis by the correlation length, you see that all the curves fall on top of each other. It means that it's a single correlation function or mutual information function that describes system of any different size. This is what's called rescaling, blah, blah, blah. Okay? <coughs> Matthew, sorry, yes. question. In traffic jams, before they happen, uh, you have solitonic configurations in the form, right? So for example, if somebody breaks, and then this, uh, the guy behind breaks and supports, this creates solitones. That's how these jams form. Is there any evidence of this in the brain? Are there solitonic configurations before you get it? What I can tell you that in the media, in the cars, these solitonics, I'll make a joke because two solitons cross each other, but you know, I have not seen cars crossing to each other. You can frame it in terms of solitons. I'm not talking about two, it shows one lane. One lane, you create one soliton in one direction. So that's, uh, that's uh, how in, it in, happens. In, in the brain, in, in the media, in the excitable media, this kind of media, uh, the, when two fronts collide, they sting with each other. So there is no, I don't know what you have in mind, but in, it, as, as a simple answer, I don't see the, the possibility to describe in these terms, but we can discuss later, okay? Um, okay, so again, if, if, if you have rescaled, so the, the, the message here is, is, this is a nice way to know if you are in if, if your system is is obeying these these properties, the fact that you know collapse all this by rescaling by the correlation length, which is the only scale in the system, you get the, a perfect collapse of all the curve. You you are in business. That's your uh, signature that uh, you finish your your dissertation in time. Now. But that is for the entire brain. You know, this is 10,000 uh, voxels of two millimeter by two millimeter in the entire brain. And 
it's a time scale relatively large. You say, okay, Dante, let's go deep into a little tiny piece of tissue uh, of the brain of one millimeter, one millimeter, repeat the experiment. And this is a beautiful work that we are doing with, uh, with Irmar Plens at uh, NIH in the United States. We still haven't published this. These are experiments done with optogenetic two-photon recording. It's a beautiful experiment that I am very excited to talk about because I'm looking for a student and postdoc. <laughs> we, just, we just got funded through the Brain Initiative, the U19 in the state. These are experiments in which you have a mice, in which you have shaved, not me, the experimentalist, you have shaved the, the, the bone of the skull to the point in which you can see through, okay? Then these mice have some modification in, the, in some proteins, such that when the neurons are active, the fluorescence of that protein change, so that you can see these, all these thousands of neurons lighting up like fireflies. And you have a nice microscope, two photon microscope, and you can record while the mouse is doing something, like choosing which to respond, extending the tongue, and so you map all these neurons, and then you have another laser and another protein that is being modified, such that when you zoom the laser, this neuron will be excited. And eventually, the, the mouse will do exactly a copy of what you have recorded. The mouse will react and stain the tongue. That's the ideal experiment. So in this experiment, what we are interested this is being taped, so we are interested about everything, but particularly I'm interested in to replicate this correlation function, but you see the scale 300 microns, okay? Between, these are the distance between few neurons, and these are three different fields of view that is equivalent to three different sizes of system. And you see that the zero crossing scale with the field of view. This is because of the renormalization you take every of your dynamics for the correlation. Because the larger field of view contains the smaller field of view. Larger field of view as it's a large system, yes. And what your point is this only happen this only happen when the system is critical. Yes. If you have a bunch of oscillators coupled together under the order regime. Okay, and you do, you repeat this, you're gonna have a finite correlation. It will be all of this crossing exactly the same point. So when you increase the field of view in a system that have finite correlation length, for instance, a lattice of couple oscillators, you will not move to the, left, to the right, it will stay there. Eh? The example, for instance, when people ask me, give me a biological example, of something that you repeat these measures, and you get all the curve one on top of the other and doesn't increase with the size, make it with your EKG in the heart of your heart, a heart of a, a mouse and a heart of a whale, okay? And the final correlation is a size and it's exactly the wavelength times the propagation velocity of it, what's called the wavelength in that case. It's fixed, okay? In this case, it moved. So I was very happy to to, to get this, this result in this collaboration. That means that you go from microns to the size of the brain, and the same uh, things uh, happen. And the criti <coughs> critical exponents are the same? Uh, uh, that's a very good question, but we have not yet measured the critical exponents, because I was discussing yesterday with some of you, uh, we need uh, either longer time or uh, better resolution space. We went to from the entire brain, but with short time series, to small places with long time series. We are in the process. Uh, sorry, apologize for a potentially very stupid question, but um, oh, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, typically, thermodynamically, these exponents are defined as you increase the system size. Okay. Uh, yeah, so can, you, you know, can, can you repeat? Can Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So thermodynamically, typically, these 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 criticalities are defined, you know, as you increase the system size, going from you know small size systems all the way to the thermodynamic limits. But in this case, you're just increasing the field of view. No, 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 no. The The thing is, you can use if you have a magnet, for instance, an icing model, do it by yourself, and you build your lattice hundred by hundred. Okay. See, and. Uh, 
And then choose, you, you, you choose, your, you, you calculate your correlation, your connected correlation for a small subset of the Ising model, 10 by 10, and then by 20 by 20, and this thing diverse. Because indeed, the, you only know that your system is 100 or 200, or whatever. Okay? So the, the finite size scaling, which is what we are doing, we are changing the size and looking how it scales with, with size, is exactly what you do. Independently, if you are operating over a small subset of your data, or if you're really you're operating over your entire data set, meaning that the, instead of the field view, you have a small brain or a bigger brain. It's a technical detail. This yeah? is exactly my question for the person. We normalize by the local. Can we move down? So the next speaker will talk. <laughs> so you, you can you organize your time? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that this is a technical point. I'm very happy to 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 answer you, uh, but it's not an artifact of taking the field of view if that's your point. No. Okay? And I provide you an example, but it seems that Daniel uh, uh, was not convinced. We we'll discuss later. Okay, let's uh, go back to uh, the second thing that you need to to show bes bef beside the. Correlation function is to define an order parameter, which is the usual way. It's an, it's an art to define for your particular system what is your order parameter. In this case, the order parameter that we choose for this system is the size of the largest cluster, okay? which is used in many cases. So that means that now you are taking a lot of data. It's the entire brain. We repeated that for the other situation, but I'm just describing for the entire brain. And you calculate. The number of clusters, for instance, here they have clusters. These are activated clusters, places in the brain that are more active than others. Again, I will have to skip the technical details. You have a, here a time series of the number of clusters in time for that brain. And this is the size of, of the maximum, the um, uh, size of the maximum, the size of the largest cluster. It's like looking at the sky and you look, pick up the the, the cloud that is large, the largest one at time t, and you put it in your file, next t plus one, the largest one, the largest one, and that's how it fluctuates. Notice that this is a logarithmic scale. And then you count the number of clouds, and you put another number there. Now, let's see if from this data, you can conclude anything meaningful. Let's first plot the number of active sites. It's like the number of, not the number of clouds, but the number of pixels occupied by clouds. And the number of clusters, meaning the number of clusters, the number of clouds. And you see that if I overimpose all the points, two things happen. Here you have only one cloud, which is tiny. Here you have one cloud that covers the entire sky. And notice in the middle, okay, you have the largest variability when the, the curve peaks. Remember the, the traffic curve that we have before? So this is already a hint that indeed you have a larger variability at some point, which is not too cloudy, not too, uh, not too overcast, not, uh, not cloudy. Now let's define an order parameter, which is this, the size of the largest cluster, and plot against the active size in the number of pixels that is occupied for a cloud. And the, the green points are the, all the data, the red are the average, and you see the average sort of show a transition, and when the transition is coincide with the largest variability, as you expect. Um, the second thing is uh, that the variability computed over these, these points, over these windows, is the squares. The variability peaks around the transition. Okay? And then you can say, OK, Show me the distribution of clusters. The distribution of clusters follow a power law, which is what you expect. Most of the time, you have clusters that are small, but you have clusters 10 to the 4, which is the size of the entire system, which you expect, with a cutoff. And now you can say, OK, show me clusters, this, the distribution of clusters, when you are here, when you're in the middle, when you're over there. So choose the data for different activity levels, and the cluster distribution follows exactly what you expect, Subcritical, low activity, critical, the, the, the black line. And when it's red, it's supercritical with a hint of a very large, one order of magnitude expectation larger for very large clusters. Okay? This is exactly what you expect uh, if the brain in this spontaneous activity 
were to be critical, and this is sort of the phase transition between the two. You can say, Dante, this is logarithmic axis, and is anywhere between subcritical and supercritical. Where is the criticality? <laughs> well, most of the time, the brain is near the transition, shown by the blue line. The blue is the resident time distribution. Most of the time, the system explains near the critical point and wander around, back and forth between subcritical and supercritical. Um, well, there is all those avalanches that were shown before. These avalanches uh, that make uh, plants and becks and plants uh, uh, happy occur also at very low scale. This is for the genetic experiment. Also, we are showing this distribution. As you see, I'm speeding up, uh, trying to get the horse finished. We did also models. Um, that will skip. These models show that there is a correspondence between the data. This is beautiful. This is a model that has 10 to the 3 degrees of freedom. And the critical line, the critical distribution of clusters, match without any fitting with the distribution, experimental distribution. The experimental distribution, I told you, that is larger, 10 to the 4. And uh, this is a physical review letter 2013 that one of my students, undergrad at that time, uh, Haimovici, and I have to skip all of this and summarize. Don't think about the brain as a circuit, definitely. That's the take home message. And this is sort of the list of things that I'm supposed to have you explain you about how the correlation functions are in the, in the brain if the brain will act to, it, to be critical. What are the implications for neuromorphin? Eh? Which I'm sure that you're waiting to know. For neuromorphin, almost none, okay? <laughs> now, if you change the topic to brain morphine, there is a few interesting ones. In the afternoon, we can discuss that at one city here. Why? Because I have heard neuromorphin in the sense that if we build a neuron, then we can build a brain, okay? But I show you that all these properties <laughs> are in cars, birds, flocking of birds, and that kind of thing. So what is the interesting part of what I said is that what is important of all these lessons is that the brains seem not to be a, a circuit, okay? That the collective effects are very uh, fuzzy and depend on keeping the degrees of freedom large. So if you keep the degrees of freedom large, maybe some of the implications uh, uh, to, to, to implement these things in some of the uh, devices that you are interested uh, can, be, can be realized. I'm, of course, looking for partners. I'm desperately trying to bring people to Argentina, which is uh, four, the record to have the uh, four largest inflation in the planet. Uh, only Venezuela is largest. But we have some few collaborations with the state, so I'm trying to see, to, to make some enthusiastic people to collaborate. This is uh, everything that I have to say. Thank you for your patience.